Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first of a series of many virtual conversations and panels we're gonna be having here at the United State of Women as we are all staying home uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Most of our work has been transitioned online. So here we are, the first of our many panels we'll be hosting here from the United State of Women. The first is women in the AAPI community trailblazing in the times of uncertainty. We wanted to make sure we were marking Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month as it is the last week of Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Heritage Month this week with this incredible panel. I am so honored to have so many leaders in the AAPI community joining us today um, and really thrilled to have our um, ambassador, Renee De Los Santos, um, moderating this afternoon for this panel. Um, I'll let Renee introduce all of our incredible panelists as, as we go, um, but I really wanted to say thank you for joining us. At the United State of Women, we've been really converting a lot of our programming online, including with our State of Women TV, which is our Instagram live series, really talking to all sorts of activists and legislators and people from across the country who have been helping to support and take action for women and girls around the country during the pandemic. And so we hope you'll join us on USOW TV. Um, we had a, the fantastic Nadia uh, from Period join us today. Um, Mia Ives Rubley, who's on with us today, uh, is going to be joining our State of Women TV tomorrow. So we're really excited to keep those going every day. Um, and today we're really excited to have this panel. So without further ado, um, we hope that you'll join us as we continue to build these throughout the rest of the year. But we wanted to turn it over to Renee, our fabulous ambassador, to kick us off. Renee, take it away. Jordan, thank you so much. And I am so honored and humbled to be with this group today. Uh, I cannot tell you enough that just for us to have this opportunity and this space to all kind of talk about AAPI women in, in leadership and to celebrate this very unique voices that we have in the month of May and beyond what happens, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Uh, today, we are gonna talk about uh, how we are being affected by uh, COVID-19, what is giving us AAPI women hope during these difficult times and what are the various actions that we are all taking to continue to uplift uh, the community uh, year round. So we'll start off with a welcome and then uh, go into our panel discussion. Uh, we will then go into a question and answer for the audience. So please feel free to, to jot down any of your questions that you have for any of our panel panelists or just in a celebration of AAPI women leadership. And then we'll go into the really important part of where are, what are the resources and the uh, takeaways and the call to actions that we would love for you guys all to take on and think about and um, move forward with post May. So without further ado, um, a little bit about myself. Uh, yes, as, as Jordan tell you, I am one of the proud ambassadors for the United States of Women representing California and the municipality of Los Angeles and uh, the city of Santa Monica. Um, I'm a proud Filipina American, first generation to the hardest working uh, immigrant parents. I'm biased, obviously. Um, born and raised in uh, Los Angeles and uh, have worked 16 plus years in media entertainment and social impact. Um, and um, I focus on the private sector and governance and get to bridge US and APAC leadership groups. Uh, so we keep this big, beautiful, diverse world spinning. Um, and I, in, in this group, I, I'm very honored because the, I don't think everyone realizes they're at home and here and in our living rooms, what incredible credentials and expertise and mastery that we have from this group. Uh, they are board members, they're community organizers, they are uh, lawyers uh, and entrepreneurs, policy makers, uh, grassroots advocates who are doing the hard work uh, on behalf of women and AAPI women interests across this great country and our uh, regions. Um, and these women, these beautiful Asian American Pacific Islander women have not only taken the seats and found the seats. They've literally built the table and completely are owning them. So I am humbled and honored uh, to be with you, with all uh, five of you today. And we are all representing different stripes of the Asian American Pacific Islander umbrella. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna go into our first, our first panelist, Tina Chen. 
She is our president and CEO of Time's Up. She also serves as the co-chair of United States of Women. She has worked to advance gender equity as a former assistant to the 44th administration, President Obama, executive, and she's also the executive director of the White House Council of Women and Girls and chief of staff to First Lady Michelle Obama prior to Time's Up. And Time's Up is an advocacy organization that has worked so hard to insist that every woman is safe at work that we have a level playing field for women and that we achieve power for women at every level. Uh, so without further ado, Tina. Well, thank you, Renee. Um, thank you, Jordan. I am delighted to be here on this panel and with this incredible group of women leaders um, to celebrate AAPI History Month. Um, Jordan knows, you know, one of my roles at the White House when we first got there was to run the Office of Public Engagement. So that's the outreach office for the president. And so I was sort of in charge of all of the monthly celebrations as we went <laughs> month to month, to month. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, from, from Black History Month to Women's History Month to API. Um, it, you know, it, it was actually one of my great pleasures because, you know, diversity is really the heartbeat and the strength mm -hmm. of our country. Mm -hmm. uh, and we sometimes forget that we're in a moment now where that is sometimes forgotten, but it is, it is really true. And it is really the strength of our creativity, of our um, resilience, um, is that is our diversity, even as challenging as it may be at times. Um, you know, Renee sort of did a, did a great job on the quick sketch. You know, I am <laughs> of my background, but a little bit more. I'm a first generation Chinese American. My parents came here in 1949 uh, from China. Not only were they immigrants, but they were refugees. And I feel it's important to un underscore that in these moments that they were refugees fleeing the war in China, um, came into a United States that welcomed them with open arms. It took two different, you know, bills of Congress to put my each of my parents on a path to citizenship. When my mother became a citizen, I found after she passed a cutout of a newspaper article in the local Cleveland paper celebrating her as a new citizen of the United States. So it was a very different time. Um, and I was sort of blessed to grow up in that moment with my parents sort of supporting me with a community that supported me. I grew up in a Jewish community with, that, with very few Chinese there at the time in the 50s and 60s in suburban Cleveland, Ohio. Um, but I then you know, went on to become a lawyer, did a lot of work when I was right out of college on the ERA, which I think really spurred my lifelong commitment to gender equity. Um, I certain, you know, was 23 years at a big corporate law firm, um, but along the way did a lot of politics and women's politics. And it, it was there in Chicago that I got to know a guy with a funny sounding name, big ears, <laughs> his wife, he, to all of our collective surprise, becomes president of the United States. And um, he asked me to go to Washington and uproot my family, which I did because you know, the president of the United States doesn't ask you to, do, to go to Washington very often. Um, so I did all eight years in the Obama administration. Um, it was my privilege to work with Jordan, you know, who, um, you know, what worked with me on the White House Council on Women and Girls. And it was from that inspiration of the work that we saw at the Council of all the women organizations coming to us, um, but often not talking to each other about the work that they were doing, even when things cut across. And I often say about United States women, you know, we know that women don't live their lives in silos, right? They are, and we see it mm -hmm. in the pandemic right now. People are trying to manage their childcare and school their children and do a job and figure out how to be an essential worker and figure out how to care for their, you know, ailing parents or other relatives and family members. And, you know, so although we've got women's health groups and women's equity groups and women, you know, you know, vi you know violence against women groups, we need to be all together and supporting one another, which is why I'm so proud of the work we do at United States of Women, which is really to do that. And then one final point, my current job is, as you know, Renee, as president and CEO of Time's Up. You know, we are the organization that was born on the red carpet in the Golden Globes two years mm -hmm. ago in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein sexual harassment allegations. We founded the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund that lives over at the National Women's Law Center. But we also know, in addition to supporting survivors of sexual harassment, we need to really keep sexual harassment from happening in the first place. And to do that, we need to build safe, fair, and dignified work for everyone. So that is our broader mission at Time's Up. And one final thing we just released yesterday, you know, our Time's Up Guide to Diversity and Inclusion in a Time of Crisis, During Crisis, giving both leaders of businesses and organizations, but also workers, what are the practical things you can do right now to stay invested in your workers, stay mm -hmm. invested in diversity and inclusion, if anybody's interested in seeing it or knowing more about Time's Up, you can text the word LEADERS 
to 30644 and you'll get the link to download a copy of the guide. And it's something you can share. You should share with friends of yours who runs or organizations or work at big companies or use it yourself. So thank you. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you, Tina. Um, I I would I would text right now, but honestly, I, I know we have <laughs> multi big, beautiful group, much multitasking like, to I'm, do all of us. <laughs> uh, but I, I know everyone is uh, going to look and and want to download the uh, this diversity and DEI inclusion resource, especially in times like this where we are all looking for ways of how we actually survive in a practical ways and applicable ways. Um, but we are going to dive into a lot of these, a lot of the issues that Tina te teed up, especially especially about unpaid uh, unpaid labor and unrecognized labor and that division that we are all feeling inside our households uh, coming from the pandemic. Um, but without further ado, Mia Ives Rubley, uh, she is an athlete, a community organized consultant and disability justice activist. And um, as a disabled Korean American transracial adoptee, Mia has dedicated her advocacy to making spaces more accessible for all of abilities. Uh, Mia is the founder of the Women's March Disability Caucus and she gave over 41,000 individuals visibility and participation in the movement for women's rights. And I know Mia is right there with me when we talk about the double standards of how all of a sudden the whole entire nation was able to miraculously overnight work from home and that has been an interesting double standard that I'm gonna looking so forward to Mia talking about later, but over to you, Mia. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really excited to be here today. As you said, my name is Mia Ives Rubley. I am a Korean adoptee. Um, I, the term is transracial and transnational adoptee. I came from Korea. Um, I, um, I, I worked as a consultant and as an activist through for many, many years and uh, most recently was working on the Warren campaign, the Warren presidential campaign in North Carolina. I was a community regional organizing director working with constituency groups to engage them in the political process. Particularly, I was working with with AAPIs in particular, trying to, to help organize our community in North Carolina. I grew up in North Carolina where not a lot of AAPIs were, were around <laughs> when I was growing up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we definitely increased our, our numbers over the past you know, decade or so. It's the fastest growing community in North Carolina now. And partially that is because of some of the immigration laws that have kept Hispanics and Latinx people out mm -hmm. of North Carolina. And so I thought that it would be particularly uh, needed to, to try and organize my community in, in North Carolina here. And so we were the first presidential campaign to fully engage with the AAPI communities working with groups on the ground that were already here, trying to, to engage them in, in political organizing. Um, and then uh, during that time, we were also one of the groups that were talking to the national team about the concerns around COVID-19 because we were talking with community members mm -hmm. who were showing a lot of concern for their family here and abroad and that was actually when the the Warren campaign actually came out with the first COVID-19 pandemic plan um, that came out for this presidential cycle. Um, and then uh, I've also, as you said earlier, worked with the Women's March, helped to found and coordinate the, the, the Disability Caucus and also worked on the national team, worked mm -hmm. on the first march and the subsequent marches afterwards, really trying to bring the, the perspective of being an Asian American, being disabled and being a woman and, and bringing that into my work and being able to, it was pretty much the first time I, was, I felt like I could really be my full self yeah. when I was organizing. 
I've also worked with a couple of other organizations, including DC Action Labs, Families Belong Together, the Ford Foundation, Planned Parenthood, and many others to ensure that they increase their work around uh, the intersection of race, disability, and gender. So again, thank you for having me on. Mia, thank you. Honestly, uh, your work on between disability justice and and for gender rights and for uh, for what we all want or hear about seeing a version of ourselves within a larger group and larger broad and broad uh, swath of what is an uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander. So thank you so much for your work. Uh, and uh, our third panelist, Elizabeth Yang, she is the founder of the Law and Mediation Offices, Elizabeth Yang over in Monterey Park, California, and has a, is a lawyer engineer and has served as the National President of the National Association of Asian American Professionals, uh, NAP, from 2017 to 2019. She is a current board member and just an all-around awesome, awesome uh, uh, business owner here in Los Angeles County. So, Elizabeth, hello. Yeah, hi, Renee. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a tremendous pleasure. So we're both here in Los Angeles. And um, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with NAP, the uh, National Association of Asian American Professionals. We're the largest pan-Asian, pan-professional organization with over 30 chapters across the entire country, also in Canada, and uh, our most recent chapter has uh, opened up in China as well, so we're now international. Um, and we've done a lot of work um, over the last few months, um, spreading the word about awareness, um, you know, doing different uh, global campaigns, um, including the hashtag I am not a virus campaign that, you know, I'll talk about later. Um, my law firm in uh, Southern California specializes in business law and family law. Um, so we've seen a rise in uh, domestic violence, unfortunately. Mm. And in the, the divorce rate, because couples who are um, isolated together during this quarantine realize they either get along really well or they can't stand each other. So <laughs> unfortunately, you know, into the pandemic, we've seen a, a big rise in that. Yeah. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, my background is actually electrical engineering and computer science. So I, I didn't start off as an attorney. And, um, you know, I, I'll later speak about the the big discrepancy in the ratio of uh, women to men in the, in the in engineering world. Um, I'm a mother of two kids here in Southern California. So, you know, it's been a difficult balance uh, trying to juggle kids and work, you know, with the kids being out of school. So yeah, yeah, yeah lots of things to talk about. <laughs> Elizabeth, thank you so much. I mean, honestly, like I said, we, when we, when we uh, met you and, and learned of everything that you've done in your career um, and still doing, uh, yes, our collective jaws just dropped. And just like, how can one be an engineer, electrical engineer, a lawyer, a mother, I mean, uh, to the testament of AAPI women and what we do and is not categorized as, as full labor. Uh, we are spinning so many plates. So thank you so much. Uh, and over to Kara Jabola Perlis uh, from, she's the executive director, Hawaii Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. And that is Kako Makina Kulana Olakino Onavahine. Uh, aloha, Kara. Uh, I'm gonna let you speak of all your aloha and everything you're doing for the state of Hawaii. Uh, hi, thank you for having us. We're so grateful to be joining you from Hawaii. Maganda mm -hmm. shout out to all the Filipinos on the call. Um, I think first of all, too, first things first, Black Lives Matter. I think um, mm -hmm. it's important for me to say that, especially as the Mestiza um, repping here, mm -hmm. those of us from the <laughs> API community um, with light skin privilege have a double duty to um, make sure we're, we're bringing our whole people and our analysis and our history to the places that we get to um, occupy. So um, just a little bit about me. So yeah, as I mentioned, I'm Filipina. I grew up in a multi-generational Filipino household with like seven, eight women at any given time. Um, you know, my family did not identify as political and we're not very politically engaged, but I often heard women um, constantly complaining about their work caregiving for white children, um, white people, whether they were in the medical um, industry or in more informal settings. Um, 
in people's homes. And so I bring that with me and it really led to my activism. So I co-founded an activist organization called Affirm, the Association of Philippi uh, well, originally Filipinas and feminists fighting imperialism, refutalization and marginalization. So a mouth, mouthful. Um, but I ended, up, I ended up dropping out of uh, a master's degree at the University of the Philippines and was of course almost disowned by my family. Um, but in a very close save, I um, ended up going to law school to redeem myself and also set myself on a different path. Um, and I specialized in native Hawaiian rights um, in law school. Um, it's something really important to me as a Filipina from a community that experiences the pain and suffering and struggle of displacement to make sure my loyalty is with um, the indigenous people where I'm at. Um, and now I um, am a bureaucrat uh, for what it's worth. So I am the executive director of a government agency in Hawaii called the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women. And we are the main policy consultant to all elected officials and government heads. We are also um, a research center and resource center and for me, that kind of means that we're also the pain receptor for women across Hawaii. So it's kind of like being the girlfriend to every um, woman or femme identified or non-binary person in the yep. state. They call me, they DM, yep. they call our office with stories. And I yep. think that through stories, it's really the only way to comprehend the oppression of women, women of color and colonized women, because it's not being collected um, in government research most of the time. So I'm really honored to serve in this capacity and also to join all of you um, on this panel and conversation. Kara, mahalo nui loa and maraming salamat po for representing such a, uh, a diverse and intersectional lens on and what it looks like for uh, having a state agency on the ground. And I know you are, you are uh, right now putting the touches on the feminist, uh, first ever feminist economic recovery plan for the state of Hawaii and, and, and submitting that. And um, we uh, celebrate you over here. And then uh, our, our last one is Sung Young Choi Maro. She's the executive director of the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and APAWF. I know we have lots of letters <laughs> representing uh, the different uh, the different organizations of, of Asian American women. Uh, but uh, Sung has uh, been Sung and NAWAPF have been really important with uh, working on the coronavirus response uh, in respects to immigrant status. That access to healthcare should not depend on immigration state immigration status. Uh, so Sung Young, please talk more about it and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Renee and Jordan and everybody else on this panel. It's so great. I've heard so much about you all. And in fact, Cara, <laughs> I was just reading an article about that very piece that y'all are working on. I'm like, who is mm -hmm. this brilliant group of people and all this stuff they're putting in there? So it's like, I just had a fan moment like two seconds ago. Right. You mentioned that. So it, it definitely, I mean, electrical engineering, I don't even know what. Right. So <laughs> like, you are all blowing my mind away. So it definitely is a privilege to be, um, you know, in the ranks, at, at least on this panel uh, with you all. Um, again, my name is Sonia Choimaro. Um, I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of NAPOF for short. That's, that's how we say our acronym. Um, we are a national organization that's working to build power with Asian American um, women and girls across the country. And we do this through community organizing, advocacy and leadership development work. Um, and as Renee mentioned, our big um, milestone was last week when we were able to get the HEAL Act for Immigrant Family, Women and Families introduced in the Senate for the first time in its history. And essentially what it would do is um, it would remove the five-year bar and also make um, Medicaid and public, public uh, services, public programs available for um, immigrants right off the bat, regardless of your status. And as you know, um, um, I mean, I know this is coming up later, but this pandemic has only magnified and brought light to the things that we have been talking about and, and saying is a problem in our community for a very long time. And so we're really excited about the introduction. It's a very small step, but uh, towards a very big dream. So we're really excited about that. I myself am an immigrant. I know 
the first thing people say is, but you don't have an accent. Actually, everybody yeah. tell me mm -hmm. that I have an American accent. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I grew up with will tell me now that I have an American accent. Um, I came to the United States to attend college when I was 18 and, you know, kind of found my way through college. And um, I think my commitment to uh, gender justice started from a long time ago, being the firstborn of my generation and into a very traditional Korean family and having a father who fought for my name to be included in our uh, genealogy book, um, our family tree book. I am the first girl, female to be in that book. And, and because of that, my other girl, you know, cousins are in the book. And, and so I, I don't know, it's just sort of something that I've, I've inherited, I, I guess, in my genes. Um, and, you know, when I came to the U.S., I really thought I would go back to, I, I grew up in a boarding school in India, so I wanted to go back to um, India or Korea where I thought there were more ish, sexism issues and issues, you know, dealing with um, class and um, economic inequality. I was floored and shocked, to be honest, to find that there were poor people in America when I first got here um, and that there were poor immigrant communities, uh, immigrant folks. And so I really dedicated my um, life uh, post-college to working as a community organizer in Chicago for the most part um, and uh, at the national level um, to do advocacy work to change our system so that it is more fair and just and will treat people with dignity. And I'm also a mother of a five-year-old. So, you know, during this pandemic, being a full-time mom, uh, you know, I thank God for Pinterest and <laughs> it has saved me. Um, and so I'm sure there are many of us here who are sharing this, you know, wearing multi hats and identities during, during this time. So I'm really excited to be on this panel with you all. Thank you, Sung Young. And, and you, you touched on, on, on a couple of different things that we are going to now dive into kind of um, leadership development and how all of these beautiful women and, and who we represent uh, have built up into our leadership spaces and really have just been empowered to really take on and represent the, the big umbrella that is AAPI women, just because we know there are 50 plus ethnic subgroups under un, underneath us. We speak 100 plus languages. So we are a small sample, but we really, these are the women who are doing the work on the ground to really make the changes that we know we need to see legislatively in our in our businesses and on the ground and in our communities. Uh, so, you know, it, it makes our lives easier. Uh, so uh, COVID-19 has been an amplifier for many inequalities in the country, including racial health disparities that we touched on, division of unpaid labor, resource distribution, uh, and more. And uh, in what ways, I wanna ask the panel, in what ways are you seeing women, especially AAPI women, uniquely affected by COVID-19? And Tina, I'll start with you. Just unmuting. <laughs> I, had <a> loud <laughs> dog. I had a loud dog for a moment that you, you guys did not get to hear. Um, well, yeah, I mean, it's critical. I mean, one of the things that is happening with this pandemic is it is revealing things which many of us have known for years, right? About mm -hmm. the predominance of women as, as essential workers, the predominance of Asian American women as caregivers um, yep. and as healthcare workers, um, and the inequities that you know they have faced for so long in terms of wage discrimination, um, discrimination at work. Um, the current pol you know, political and social environment that we're li living in has exacerbated you know, anti-Asian sentiment. Um, I was actually watching this morning, um, there was a you know, uh, Chinese-American ER doc you know, on, you know, who had you know, several months ago when she got off a shift, completely harassed right, and followed by yeah. someone yelling at her, what are you doing bringing the virus to our country? She said, American born, <laughs> she's a healthcare worker. She had just gotten off a shift, yeah. you know, actually helping people, you know, to have that, that, yeah. that happen. And so, you know, this is what, as we celebrate this particular Asian American Heritage Month, you know, are really facing. And it's, it's an irony of this crisis, but that it is actually, I think, revealed to the rest of the country a lot of these disparities that we have known have existed for a long time, but we're really went unseen. So now the challenge is what do you do about it, right? Now the challenge okay. as we see it starting to happen in, for example, in our healthcare spaces where as the hospitals have been hit really hard and I understand it, that they're in a physical crisis, but the idea that you would now start laying off 
right? You are essential workers who've been cleaning your ERs and doing the orderlies who've been moving sick patients around. You know, putting them on furlough is something that, you know, really we need to start paying attention to and having not happen. You know, you know, if we want to honor of these healthcare workers that people are clapping for every night, then let's address the inequities in their workspaces and in the job opportunities they have. Um, you know, there's a tremendous crisis going on with domestic workers, you know, that Ai Pu at the National Domestic Workers Alliance has been working so hard on um, because, you know, those caregivers in people's homes, first of all, mm -hmm. didn't work, you know, were, 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 had no work in many cases or would go to work, you know, without protections, you know, with, you know, with, with, with wage discrimination, you know, with no place to go because, you know, they were not considered, you know, workers that are covered by any of the protective laws that we have, you know, for workplace protections. Um, we know there's a tremendous amount of sexual harassment that occurs in those environments. Um, so, you know, this is the challenge that I think the virus has actually exposed and, really caused many of us, you know, in this space to really have to double down, realize this is the time to double down on these efforts, not to disinvest, not to mm -hmm. stop on these, not to say we've got to put economic issues before these issues. You know, in order to build resilient, you know, economy, we have to actually invest in these workers. Thank you, Tina. You're absolutely right. This is the time, even though we are at a, at a point where we are um, able to see all these inequities that are really uh, coming to light. But I would love to um, hear from Sun Young on the same issue with uh, immigrants and how they are, are uh, how our immigrant women are, are being affected um, by COVID in terms of they are largely on the front lines of as domestic workers and, and our um, uh, healthcare workers as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, everything Tina said, and I just so instead of repeating, I want to add to the conversation. I think the other piece is that many immigrant um, families, including women, uh, immigrant women, are small business owners and mm -hmm. also have very limited English um, capacity. And so one of the things that I've had sort of a secondhand um, experience with is a lot of the Korean business owners in my neighborhood and in in the Chicago area who are not able to access support and information um, in a timely manner, right? So as the state is starting to shut down, the governor is getting on TV every night, giving out new orders and new regulations, and it's not getting translated quickly enough into the languages, especially into Asian American languages, for people to, for business owners to understand like what, their, what the compliance here really is. Right. So, so I was, I walked into one of our, you know, neighborhood restaurants and they had, they lost business for, for a whole weekend because they did not understand that the, the dine-in uh, ban was from Monday end of day. Right. Like they right. just heard, right. you can't sell food anymore. Right. It's closed. So they've only been doing takeout. And so there's just, a, there's, there was a lot of confusion, you know, rightfully so. I think all the public officials were trying to figure out what to do. And this language barrier was really, really big. And this has also been a barrier in accessing not just the PPP, forget the PPP loan, right? Like we all know mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. who did it go to? Shake, you know, what is it? Shake, whatever the big. Yeah, it's Shake Shack. It went to the, all the big. Shack, all the big it went to Ruth Christie's, you know, pot bellies, like mm -hmm. not the people who actually need this money. And even though our state and city has put in additional programs, again, it's a language barrier issues. They don't have enough people who can process paperwork or translate and even for unemployment, right? Like uh, I'm on a board of an immigrant rights organization, a Korean immigrant rights organization. And they, I mean, they are getting bombarded with calls from Koreans who need to apply for unemployment, who need help filling out forms because none of these forms are available to them in the language that they speak. So that is a huge barrier. In terms of the harassment piece, I will add that, you know, before the pandemic, women, you know, we we were always aware walking out the door that that there is that of our, you know, our physical surroundings, right? That we know, you know, especially, you know, with with Time's Up and Me Too, all of this stuff happening, it's just so much more in our faces. And to be honest, I don't know that it's reduced the frequency of assault and harassment. It's just that it's being reported more, so it's more in people's minds, right? And so uh, one of the st statistics I've heard is that 
Asian American women are two to three times more likely mm -hmm. to be depressed than Asian American men. Mm -hmm. And I unfortunately have been yelled at on the street and every single time has been by a man. And every, mm -hmm. every instance I've heard of is men yelling at women, men threatening women, right? Like I know there are women out there also being racist and all that. So I'm not trying to give them a pass, but the reality is this, this intersection of race and gender really makes us vulnerable to what's going on right now, right? That, that would, would a man really, you know, I, I think there is a vulnerability around like the fact that we are women and that we're less likely to fight back or that yep. we would be more easily scared or whatever it is that this, that this happens to us. Um, right. And so I think, you know, and, 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 you know, with the pandemic and, all of the small businesses being closed. And, you know, I think it's also doubly compounded for Asian American businesses because even before all of the shutdowns started happening, uh, one, Asian Americans who um, have connection to Asia and was seeing what was unfolding yep. in China and Taiwan yep. was already voluntary uh, social distancing. So people were canceling, you know, big grandpa's birthday yep. parties at the banquets and, you know, Lunar New Year got canceled. I mean, so many people backed out of Lunar New Year plans. And so at that, and then the, the racism of, oh, I can't eat Chinese takeout because of coronavirus, mm -hmm. which is so ridiculous. And like, even I can't take, eat Thai food or Korean food or whatever. I can't eat any Asian food because of coronavirus, right? Yeah. That yeah. has really, really played a huge role in, um, in how the small businesses have been affected. And I think- yep that's really worth a mention here. Oh, it's, it's um, worth a couple of big mentions because I, I think, you know, we see Asia as being everywhere, not just in Asia, not just there, and we see it everywhere and then kind of in globalization, everything that is powering this Zoom <laughs> right now in the infrastructure and supply chains um, down to cuisine and and where are so uh, that that definitely thank you for teeing up uh, kind of what are the social ramifications that we as AAPI at API women are experiencing uh, this disturbing trend in anti Asian sentiment we've um, we've seen uh, the polls showing that a third of Americans have witnessed individuals blaming Asians for COVID-19, calling it the Chinese virus, Wuhan virus. And that um, this really saddens me, three out of 10 Americans blame China for the pandemic. And we see how this trickles down, how this will look 30, 60 to 90 days out um, and this division. So um, Elizabeth, I would love to hear you jump in on this from, a, the, uh, from the voice of the professional and, and business owner and uh, your thoughts from what you're hearing from the, the community at NAP. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, in the legal industry, um, women are definitely um, at a disadvantage right now. You know, they're stuck at home while they're working or taking care of the family, um, having to take care of the kids and um, worry about work or, you know, their husband at the same time. So we've noticed um, a lot of phone calls recently um, inquiring about divorces. Um, and the courts are closed. They're, like in Los Angeles, the courts are not even going to be open until June 22nd. So yeah, we can file papers, but there's no judges readily available to have any hearings at this time. Um, they're doing like emergency hearings for restraining orders, but a lot of women like they're stuck at home. So they're afraid to go and file a restraining order against their yeah. abuser. Like yesterday, we got a phone call from a woman trying to get some information about what to do if she wanted to file a divorce. And then all of a sudden, a man grabs a phone and tells us, I'm her husband and hangs up on her, uh, hang, hangs up on us. So, you know, there's a lot of this stuff happening right now. And um, there's, there's a lot of phone calls to the police, but there's also a lot of calls that are not being made. And it's not just domestic violence against women. It's also against children, too. Um, I don't know if you guys watched mm -hmm. the documentary about Gabrielle Fernandez, but um, you know, a lot of times teachers are the ones that are making phone calls to report child abuse. And because the schools are closed right now, kids are stuck at home and we don't know what's happening to them. You know, in the poor uh, communities, a lot of the um, kids rely on school lunches for food. So when they're not going to school, they're probably going hungry at home and no, but nobody's reporting it. You know, obviously the parents are, are not going to be reporting it. So there's a lot of stuff that are going on behind the scenes that we're not even seeing in the news right now. And the ramifications are just going to come out um, in the long run, uh, you know, in the next few months later this year. 
is very devastating. Yeah, and that's a, that's an important to note in terms of where we all see the how the social dynamics within the households have been deeply changed, how our access to safe spaces. Uh, a lot of people looked at school, social connections, social, social environments as ways to get out and putting everyone in just the, a tiny bubble, no matter what size of space uh, that you are. And if you're in an intense situation at home um, and uh, having to just deliver uh, different, different household responsibilities and haven't really figured out that balance, that is enormously stressing day in, day out. So uh, between NAWAPF, NAP, uh, Hawaii, and, and, uh, and Time's Up, and USOW, that's why we see ourselves as resources for women to turn to, to, to find um, places to turn to, because we know it's hard when you're just stuck within four walls. Um, and in terms of accessibility and, and what that means in, in this time of COVID, uh, Mia, I would love to hear your, your perspective as well. Yeah, you know, when I'm thinking about the the intersection of, of, you know, AAPI identity and also disability, I think about a couple of things. One would be just thinking about the access to health care. Uh, a lot of immigrant households aren't don't have health insurance, uh, mm -hmm. particularly Southeast Asians. And so what I think about is, is that we are actually as a whole AAPI community is the least likely to interact with healthcare system. And mm -hmm. so that has a number of indications, whether we are talking about people going to, to their doctors to go see if they have symptoms that, that need to be checked, or if we're looking at things like mental health care, which is extremely important, especially as we are all self-isolating from one another, you know, the AAPI community, we are very much a community about networking and about getting to know each other and about, you know, doing community events, et cetera. And so to have that all ripped away and then requiring people to, to stay at their homes and plus the anti-Asian sentiment, this all come, boils down to people being affected by, uh, you know, poor mental health outcomes. And so rather than, uh, you know, the AAPI community in particular, mm -hmm. mental health is a taboo. Yeah. You know, it, it's not something that we talk about a lot in AAPI communities. And so having that all mixed in together means that a lot of our community are either using means of, of self-medicating yeah. or, or, you know, just suffering with, without any help. And so that's one thing that I think about when talking about AAPIs in, in, in the time of COVID-19. And then I also think about the, the ramifications around accessibility at, around the workplace. Because when I'm, when you look at, especially particularly Southeast Asians and, mm -hmm. you know, Asian Americans who also work in the healthcare industry, those are seen as essential workers. And so a lot of AAPI community members are in harm's way right now because mm -hmm. they are required to work or their businesses would basically fold if they weren't working or they're working at the meat packing plants that we know are have significantly high rates of uh, po to, po positive test results down there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the fact that, that many of our community members can't, don't have the option to stay home is, is a problem in our community. And then lastly, I would say, you know, like you were saying in, in my introduction about talking about some of the work accommodations that we are now providing everybody, it, it's been very interesting, especially from the disability community. You know, a lot of people are saying, you know, they're miserable, they can't go out to, to the grocery store, or can't go to the gym, or, and, and a lot of the disability community is like, welcome to our world. Mm -hmm. um, because they, they, you know, a lot of places are inaccessible. So we, we have to sort of self-isolate just because of the fact that we can't go yeah. to these locations. And then on top of a lot of 
workplaces have told us that you can't, they, the job can't be done remotely or they can't provide accommodations mm -hmm. for, for the work. And then all of a sudden everybody needs something and it's provided. And I think a lot of people in, in the disability community have been, have been sort of rolling their eyes in, in terms of seeing sort of the, the outcomes <laughs> of what happens when everybody needs something and it's not right. something that we can, you know, a lot of organizations will say, yeah, we can't accommodate that, but suddenly they can. So it's been right. an interesting time. It's, it's, it's very interesting to see kind of that privilege all of a sudden just really showing up and servicing the entire masses when now we all know that these, these solutions to work from home, to, to service uh, people who have accessibility issues and, and really actually think very thoughtfully how our workforces, how our organizations are serving people that have limitations um, with access and, um, and everything in between that. So uh, honestly, yes, and, and to touch on your point about mental health and, and the AAPI uh, stigma, and, and women, we are so we are proud. Uh, we are proud cultural people, and we we lean on each other. And to your point, yes, having that uprooted um, has has been difficult. And so we want to make sure that a lot of the women who are especially on this call know that there that these are there are so many groups on the ground that are you know you can turn to in 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 these times that are very stressful. And do not be afraid to be vulnerable and speak out. That is a great quality of leadership, um, which I, I really wanna get into uh, with uh, Cara first, um, considering, considering your success in the respective field and, and putting together this amazing feminist and economic recovery plan that all of the states, we, everyone's looking at it uh, in awe and uh, to Sung Young's point, uh, completely fangirling over. Uh, what role has your AAPI identity between Filipina and being in Hawaii uh, and being around all that Polynesian aloha uh, how has that played in influencing your career path as well as your vision uh, for your future? Um, well, it informs my analysis in every way. You know, like I said, I show mm -hmm. up as a Filipina and as somebody who's had to struggle with this question of like, which homeland do I fight from? Yeah. Um, and how do I translate all of the beautiful like stories and theory building from our Filipino and AAPI communities into a better material reality for our women um, and our non-binary folks. Um, and so for me, I didn't see much of a place for that. And for yep. me in mainstream Western feminism, um, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I mean, like, especially Filipinos, South Asians, um, indigenous people, um, are structurally stuck in this species essential activities that liberates white women and light women um, mm -hmm. who claim it's empowering for us and dignified work, right? And that we should right. just be focusing on rights. And for me, I wanted to do work that was focused on root causes. So totally shifting like the, the women's advocate space um, where I am to thinking about or moving away from inclusion and equality within this system that we're in, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy, to liberation from these industries and from this system. So it's kind of like what Maya was saying, our value, billions of people, yeah. our value is, is not as workers. We cannot participate in capitalism equally. It is futile to try to do that. And so, you know, the work that I do, it's, it's to empower women to understand that they have value inherently and not as workers. Um, and also to reorient the economy away from tourism, from these mm -hmm. precarious industries, from militarism, which those are the two that define Hawaii and luxury development um, that are really not getting us anywhere. Um, and you know, now our employment rate in Hawaii is 40%. It's the highest in the country and it's majority um, immigrant and indigenous women. And we know that it's gonna be difficult to get these jobs back. And in fact, in the hotel industry alone, they're saying that 40% of the jobs will not be restored, but will be automated. Um, so 
that's just kind of why I chose to do the work. I think I'm going beyond the question at this point, so I'll stop myself. No, 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 no. You are you're addressing that's, exactly. Yeah, that's we, right. Mm-hmm. As is Dred, now you're addressing exactly how um, each of our organizations. Uh, we don't talk. We we do a lot of advocacy and and awareness about where the problems are, but really the crux of it is getting down to what are the root causes that have built these inequity inequities in the first place. Uh, so you know, in terms of that, it, it it takes a strong strong sense of self, a strong sense of woman and your identity, um, in terms of to forge that path, right? Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, I'm going to start with a quick fire question because I know we're, we're close to closing up here. Um, so we want to talk about kind of what we see for the new workforce, right? That's coming. We saw class of 2020 and God bless all our graduates. Uh, we know that they have been through a time seeing what has been taken away from their experience of creating milestones from graduating from high school, uh, undergraduate college from uh, from higher ed programs. Um, uh, what advice would you give AAPI women who are newly entering this workforce, especially when they're confronting the societal barriers that we know as the glass ceiling and the bamboo ceiling? Uh, Tina, I will start with you. Um, well, that is, that is a great question. And I, I think it's something we face, especially when we first started in the workforce, but probably for yeah. many of us all through our careers, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the first piece of advice I give um, is always you've got to sort of find your own voice and find your own strength. And I think it was a me or, some, uh, or a car who said, you know, we have to understand our own self-worth and our value, right? And stand in that and stand in that truth, regardless of what the external forces may mm -hmm. be telling you. Um, and they are. And you've got to sort of turn off those voices and really trust yourself. It's hard to do. And when you first start out as a young person, it is actually mm -hmm. very hard to do. It's hard to walk into a room that is entirely white men, especially if you're young and you may mm -hmm. be the youngest person in addition to being the only woman, the only person of color, and to turn off all of the, the, the glances that you're getting or the jokes that you're gonna get or the well-meaning pats on the head, you know, and understand that you're there for a reason and you've got value to put on the table and a voice and a point of view to make. I will also say that, you know, reach out. I mean, part of the point of the United States of Women is to provide a place where if you're new to this and you're new to figuring it out, that you can get connected to all mm -hmm. of our organizations, right? You know, we wanted mm -hmm. United States of Women to be the one place you could come regardless of where, where you're living in the country, what issue you're confronting, that you can reach in and find a way to get connected to any one of our organizations or the other organizations mm -hmm. that are out there and find that support. It doesn't have to come from a mentor in your workplace. It can come from you know, your colleagues elsewhere in the community, in the movement. Um, and I would encourage everybody to do that. And then one final thing, because it's 2020 and I can actually not, not end this conversation <laughs> without saying, so I'm about to go do a When We All Vote you know, API program later yeah. on is that, you know, we're in we're in the fight for our lives this year, yeah. and a, the API community, while we are the fastest growing minority group, is actually vastly underregistered and unrepresented in voting. And um, part of finding your voice, part of standing up for our community, part of making the world better in so many ways for our community is to exercise that most fundamental piece of our voice, which is to register and to vote. And so I hope everyone who's listening to this, grabs their friends, grabs all their families, grabs their entire neighborhood to go do that this year. Thank you, Tina. Uh, that's absolutely, that's uh, you hit on all the points about uh, where we need our workforce and our, our new graduates to come in. Mia, I would love you to uh, love for you to stack onto that because I know you're doing work on the ground and you are such an inspirational leader uh, getting, getting voters just just signed up. So we'd love to hear from you on, on uh, what keeps your identity and what's yourself as a as um, keeps your identity as an AAPI woman leader? Yeah, I well again, thank you for having us on this amazing call, this amazing panel. But I I guess I would say you know I growing up I grew up in a, a white household as a transracial adoptee, and for for me I just didn't really understand what it meant to be an Asian American for, for a very long time. And I didn't feel like I fit into a perfect little box. And I would say 
that's okay. You don't have yep. to fit into a perfect little box and to try and find a place where you feel comfortable in being your full self. Yeah. So if an organization requires you to just be one thing or another, then maybe that organization is not the organization you should be working with. Maybe it's another yeah. organization that provides you space and allows you to be who you truly are and allows you to really work on on the, the passion projects that you're, you're, you want to work on. And I would say also, you know, I think that, and I know it's kind of cliche, but you never stop learning in this process. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing this work or adjacent work for all of my life and I'm still learning a lot of things. And I would say, you know, you, you're going to go into a job and you're going to feel like, maybe especially for women and api women in particular is you're going to feel kind of like a fraud like you don't fit in or or that you might not be as good as as everybody else around you and i would say everybody is feeling that way and everybody is mm -hmm. trying to learn as much as possible and the time that you stop learning is the time that you probably need to move on to the next thing because mm -hmm. you should be learning in this in the movement in organizing spaces it's important to to continue to learn i hope that my growth continues on into to my you know golden years or whatever mm -hmm. and so you know i i usually tell people you know be comfortable with being uncomfortable in these spaces because if you're not then it means that you're not pushing yourself hard enough in terms of, of learning new things, in terms of working on, on things that are risky and that that might not have a lot of gain, but but maybe you'll learn a lot. So, you know, I, I major congrats to everybody who is graduating right now. And, you know, this is just a start and and just continue, continue to learn and, and grow. Mia, thank you so much. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I, I was going to have a box of tissues by my thing. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. And I, I, as I'm hearing what you guys are, are uh, suggesting for all the graduates and the young constituents and Elizabeth, I, I would love to hear your thoughts as well in terms of what you tell the younger members that are incoming into NAB um, and how you, you take in your leadership values and core set as an AAPI woman leader and, um, and professional. Yeah, absolutely. So my main um, takeaway would be to um, be able to influence your own conversations, you know, because mm -hmm. everybody's there's, there's conversations from everywhere from the news, you know, from coworkers, from the community, but you get to grasp on to what conversation is meaningful and um, impactful for you. So like, for example, um, as an engineer, um, going through engineering school, the ratio of women to men was one to 12. So in all my classes, I was, you know, one of a couple of women, sometimes the only female, you know, mm -hmm. even uh, finishing college and going to my first job in the engineering world, it was an industry full of men. There was like a handful of women in our entire department. So, you know, you can come into this with like the conversation like, oh, you know, I'm the minority and I'm at a disadvantage. Or you can come into this conversation as, you know what, I'm unique and I'm like the only woman here. So, you know, I bring a very um, significant factor that everyone else doesn't. And mm -hmm. I grabbed onto that second conversation because that was what worked for me. And I was able to grab onto some mentors, you know, they're like, oh, you know, you're the only female here. So we're going to mentor you instead of everybody else. So if you grab onto like the positive conversations, you'll do well for yourself because in every story in life, there's always multi sides. So if you mm -hmm. grab onto the side that's like disadvantageous to you and oh, poor me, then that's what's going to happen to you. But if you are like, you know what, I don't care that I'm the minority here, you know, I'm still going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm actually at, a, at an advantage because I'm a minority, then mm -hmm. it's going to work out great. Right. Exactly. You kind of have to find the strength and it does take, you know, to Mia's point, it does take a lot of just keep on finding what works and really understanding that truth and that self. And Elizabeth, thank you so much. Uh, Cara, to, to Elizabeth's point, what are the 
what are the voice of leadership and your identifying self that uh, you would, would advise to the class of 2020 and incoming workers into the workforce? Well, I, well, as like, I, so I'm a millennial in government, which is like still pretty <laughs> lonely. Um, so I get constant, like terrible unsolicited advice. And even though like I'm a, I'm a mom of multiple children, but I'm treated like I'm a preteen often. So I think about this a lot. Um, yeah. I think the, like the three main things I would say would be be radical. It is absolutely a lie that you can have to not be radical to be in any space. I mean, you can become like the head of a government agency, like, but mm -hmm. how I did that was organizing. You have to build your allies. So build allies is so key for us, um, especially like people who are consolidated around our analysis. And then I think too, like kind of specific to our community a little bit, um, which kind of ends negatively, but I'll try to say something positive after. <laughs> Beware of gatekeepers. I think that there's yeah. a fine line between mentors and gatekeepers, and especially like as yeah. a Filipina, like I will always defer to like the OG and the oldest person in the room. Mm -hmm. But I, sometimes there are some people who just want to build their army and hold you back. And it's okay to do your own thing and build new people. So always be looking to you know, not like, and especially once you start getting into like the mentor role, cause you know, you age out a little bit and start getting there. Like I'm starting to do, like, I try to be really mindful and, and encourage independence and like not having to go through me, but just open doors. Um, and I think finally, like just channel the ancestors, man. Like that's how you do it. I mean, you will be attacked so often. Like if you show up mm -hmm. as you, but you know, just go back to your history. Like any consult with people in the community who know it, you know, um, and that's what gets me through things. So that's my piece. Yeah. Kara, no, uh, mahalo for that. I mean, we all know the Kapuna and the elders and our lineage plays so much of our cultural DNA and identity that, you know, we are forced with a responsibility and a legacy to succeed or to keep trying. Uh, so Sung Young, I'm going to look to you for the closing statement of leadership values and sense of self and culture that has driven you to be uh, where you are with NAWAPF and what your advice is to the class of 2020 and the incoming workers uh, and to our workforce here. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's I, everything everyone said just so resonated. And I was just thinking, oh my God, I wish I knew that when I first stepped into right? the workforce, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and, and sort of, uh, resonating and summary, I would say that the big picture is, especially if you are based in the United States and going into mainstream workforce, this country was not built for us. It was not made to benefit people like us, whether it's because you're a woman, because you're an immigrant, or because you're a person of color. Um, and I remember spending so many days in my early years like, things being said and I'm, I'm, I'm looking around like everybody's acting like it's normal. And I'm like, am yeah. I the crazy one? Like I've had so many of those moments where men are cracking sexist jokes, like it's locker room banter. And I'm looking around like, am I the only, like, is this normal? And I'm the only one getting offended. And it took me a long time to realize that our systems are not set up for people like us to thrive. And that's why we have to fight. And, mm -hmm. and for me, what I also want to say is you're not fighting alone. We need to build power. And to Tina's point, this is an election year. Pay attention and, you know, build allies. Like all of the things everybody said, right? Like, if, and there are environments that are super toxic. That's not an environment for you. How do you find support? How do you find ways to take care of yourself? Because, you know, the mental health crisis of people of color in this country is real, of women yeah. is real, sexual mm -hmm. harassment. Israel, no one told mm -hmm. me sexual harassment was. And then I was like, the first time it happened to me, I'm like, oh my God, right? Like, and, it, and then the realization came two yeah. years later, right? So talk to people, ask for help, lean on people, but most importantly, build power with people who will have you and your community at the center of self-interest because our liberation are bound up in each other's liberation and we need to fight this together. And so- First step is go register to vote, go vote. That's not the end of it. You know, we need to continue to advocate for systemic changes so that we can all live with dignity and agency. 
Sung Young, thank you so much. And to each of our panelists, uh, Thank you so much for answering those really deep, thoughtful questions. I, it's definitely going to be in my meditation loop now uh, to hear your guys' voices and your insights. Tina, Mia, Elizabeth, Kara, Sang Young. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, we're gonna turn it over to Gabriella right now. So she's going to tell us exactly what are our call to action? What are our takeaways from this? What are the resources that we can turn to for this? Um, and um, over to you, Gab. Hello, I am also going through the steps of unmuting myself. My name is Gabriela Cristobal and I run programs at USOW. And to share um, one of our first uh, actions that, that some folks on the call can take, I'm actually going to introduce our friend, Madeline. Are you on the call? There we go. I am. Hi. I will let you take it away. Great, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak with all of you today about um, the work that APEX is doing. Uh, um, and, and in June, uh, we are doing um, an event with Running Start on um, June 4th at 3 p.m. We're having a panel discussion with um, API women who are in office, as well as those who have run in the past, um, to really talk about um, the obstacles and challenges, as well as uh, the successes that they've had in terms of running for office. So we're really fortunate to have um, KPAC Chair, Congresswoman Judy Chu give opening remarks, um, and Nadia Okamoto, who um, runs a really wonderful organization um, called Period. Um, she is going to be also a panelist on uh, this uh, very interesting webinar. So we hope that people can sign up on the bit.ly link and join us um, as we talk a little bit more about how API women can um, become elected officials and be in public service. Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, and for everyone that is listening or tuning in, we'll also send around those links and Apex work so that you all can check them out. And then that being said, I think it goes without saying, although we don't have a slide for it, a call to action that we hope absolutely everybody will take is voting, voting in local elections, voting in November. Um, we have a voter registration portal through our friends with when we all vote that we will send out. And um, speaking of when we all vote, we also have another fantastic event tonight. It is a voting squad training that they are running. And I know Tina, you will be speaking on that. Excited to, to see you speak again this evening. Um, and it's really going to be, again, to honor this month and AAPI Heritage Month. Um, there's going to be some fantastic guests from the South Asian community. So I hope anyone who is able to will join us. Um, we've got the link we all dot vote backslash South Asian squad. Um, so you can register now, otherwise we'll send that out as well for you all. And then another resource that we have for uh, many of you in the South Asian community is the Muslim Women's Professionals Network. They have a fantastic newsletter and were founded and run by one of our other fantastic Californian ambassadors. So we have a beautiful network across the country that we're trying to connect you all with. And we'll also be sending around all of the resources that any of our panelists mentioned. So with that being said, I want to take just one more moment. Thank you all for coming on today, for sharing your work and your perspectives. I know this is just the beginning of many conversations that we're having or have had with you all already. Um, a plug for our State of Women TV is that Mia will be on uh, tomorrow speaking with our Executive Director Jordan again. So we will send wrap up notes and we thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Thank you all.